Yeah, I'm Dmitry, based in Vancouver, and I'm working as a data engineer, now mostly contractor. In the past, I've worked with Amazon, where I had lots of marketing activities related to building contribution models, the, the marketing metrics related to the Amazon performance, and used to work with Amazon Alexa. Then I work with uh, Microsoft Xbox, where I did migrations of uh, Trino, and we migrated to Databricks, also working mostly like game telemetry and some of the Xbox data, some more coming from like central Microsoft data store, some marketing activities, but everything related to a particular title. Most recently, I work like different projects as a contractor with Snowflake and DBT and Airflow, or sometimes it's uh, Databricks. Mostly work on AWS, and with my Microsoft experience, yeah, I have good knowledge of Azure. And I also had one contract working on GCP and Trino. So Trino was deployed on Kubernetes. And yeah, we use DBT and Iceberg Lake House. Tell about your recent projects with Rock Your Data. What was the setup? Rock Your Data is, is my incorporation. I work with contractors. The, the most recent project I was working, it was Trino. It was fintech company. They had uh, Trino deployed on Kubernetes. I was building DBT models and integrations. We used Airflow for orchestration, Metabase for BIs, and the open source engine. Most data sources related to like Postgres backend databases directly integrated with Trino. Because it's fintech, we have lots of compliance reporting. Trina works nice in terms of connecting different things like SFTP, spreadsheets, some other external databases. My primary role was then I joined. I worked a lot on DevOps thing because then I joined. I was the first data engineer on the team and the all prior team left. My goal was to set up the ICD process for DBT and Trino, set up the development environment more or less track the quality, enforcing lots of dbt tests and documentations. Also implemented uh, open metadata on top of Trina and it it's also in Kubernetes and it syncs with um, dbt docs catalog all in single place that is nice for users. Maybe mention about another project that I worked prior, it was uh, Snowflake the team is migrated Redshift. It was on AWS. I was working for Rogers with the show integration and they had uh, on AWS the Snowflake database. The goal was to build uh, out of Elastic MapReduce feeds, Elastic MapReduce job pushing data into Snowflake. And then inside Snowflake, we use DBT to build the data models and Airflow for orchestration. My core skills is at Snowflake, DBT, and Databricks. And I can equally work on AWS and Azure. And with my the most recent projects, I it was the first on GCP, but they all similar. What was your biggest project you are proud of? What were the challenges you met? The one project really proud is uh, actually building uh, the Delta Lake on Databricks that I did in Microsoft. It was around like 2021. Databricks wasn't that popular, the Delta Lake approach wasn't that popular, and I had the good opportunity to try this out. We had managed uh, Trina on top of HD Insight in Asia. It was uh, like doing uh, a kind of uh, staging environment, and then the rest was in the SQL Server on premise. It was slow, it wasn't scalable, sometimes there was outgage, especially at the peak of the game telemetry. So the challenge obvious, my proposal was to use Databricks as a unified platform where we can migrate everything and uh, both from SQL Server and uh, Trino, then manage it together in the single environment. And also we will have dedicated clusters for different workloads and we can scale up and down them. And finally, we can use the Delta Lake approach. It means whatever we do, with the star schemas and the fact tables, window functions or merge operation, we can actually do this inside Databricks. I started from POC, just grab a couple running pipelines in productions end to end and migrated them. I used the medallion architecture and it had like bronze, silver and gold. My primary source of data were like JSON uh, telemetry 
that was partitioned by hours, so my job's running every hour, and then pushed to across the layers. And then I work close with um, data science and BI team. So BI team was working with fact tables, hook Tableau in Power BI, and machine learning team, I helped them onboard with Databricks that they can start using either bronze or silver staging tables for their machine learning models. I use PySpark for everything. It works very nice. It helped me to also introduce the Databricks across Microsoft Gaming and some other studios pick up this approach. Some pick up the Azure Synapse. It was quite good. I still like Databricks in terms of the product and the quality of the pipelines and everything. It definitely gives you more freedom and maybe slightly more complicated versus Snowflake that it's just manage everything for you. I also trying a streaming approach uh, with Databricks using Delta streaming feature because I have the old JSON generated by Event Hub and I directly hook them to Databricks bronze layer and append to silver layer. But it was kind of like still better, the Delta streaming. And every time that my pipeline failed, it was very hard to find the last checkpoint and recover it. So I stick to just early things. Were you working as a part of a team? What was the team dynamics? In our team was two data engineers. One, the data engineer who built like initial solution with um, HD Insights and uh, SQL Server and everything. So he was a kind of continue to maintain everything as is, versus I was dedicated on this like, new initiative to try it, introduce, propose, and then we together migrated the rest of solution. We also had like two data scientists and two analysts slash like, BI uh, developers. How did you evaluate new tools and technologies? Since it was a migration project, there are two main points in terms of tools and technology. And usually tools and technology, unfortunately, it's constrained to the requirements of organizations, especially like big organizations like Microsoft. Obviously, you tie to Azure offering. You, you can choose anything you like on Azure, but it should be Azure specific, Synapse, Databricks or SQL Server or any other Microsoft product. And the second, I should do a proof of concept and do this proof of concept and write the design proposal to convince technical or engineering manager and my teammates that it's worth the effort. And uh, I mentioned the cost, performance and the benefits because I did also POC for Synapse and Synapse didn't work well. So even couldn't complete my POC on Synapse because of many issues. Just platform didn't work. And gladly, I've got exception to use the Databricks because I was escalate the issue. They pushed to stick with Synapse because it's Microsoft idea was to use, everyone use Synapse, but we, we get exception to use the Databricks because the product was well. Another thing, since it's migration projects, I trying to, to decouple the solution into layers. For example, I have application sources. What kind of application sources, how frequently the data coming, uh, what's the size of the data, then storage itself. I want to use uh, data warehouse, data lake, lake house, and then I need to decide on ETL tool that will process data, move data, and orchestrate the data. Again, limitations is the company-wide policy, and I think it might work really nice for startups. They can just pick up anything. But in startups, usually have the different challenge that I couldn't use commercial vendors. My fintech company, we stick to open source. I can use anything uh, that I can hook to Kubernetes cluster and it's open source. Uh, the downside of open source for me it's slow down development and based on a couple companies I work with open source as soon as development team is leaving it's just the black box no one knows how it works it's very hard to scale and maintain the team wastes lots of time trying to fix the issues instead of delivering the value that's also like pros and cons that we want to use commercial versus open source and I'm glad like the big companies they already more or less like to use uh, commercial uh, software, especially I'm talking about the platforms like Databricks and Snowflake. For Airflow orchestration, it doesn't have any load, so it's usually not the problem. The DBT core itself, for me, I found that it's probably exception among all open source that anyone who used DBT core never had any single problem. It, it works so well 
that it's hard to convince people to pay for dbt labs as soon as i can decouple the systems to see the storage the processing layer and also decide okay are we good to stick to batch because i i believe the usually the batch early daily you know, six hours a day it's covering like 95 percent of business needs as soon as i can decouple the solution by the key elements i can find what i want to use for each of them among the tools the organization's using already and i always open to do some kind of poc to compare pros and cons and write the document and share with the team to collect the feedback is it good or bad have you worked with redshift and bickery in the past in amazon i worked among three different teams and uh, every team had the Redshift as a primary data warehouse and my very first project in Amazon was migrations from Oracle to Amazon Redshift. They had to completely decouple uh, ETL, so we use PLSQL. Oracle was on-premise and it was 2017. It was very early stage for the cloud data warehousing, so completely need to find a way to migrate Oracle Data Warehouse on-premise with PLSQL to the cloud. The moving the data in the schema, not hard. The hardest part, you need to move the ETL process. Even if you have the logic, the biggest concern of those migration things, how you're going to validate the logic. And I, I have very good examples on the marketing. We had the attribution model that was in PLSQL that stick many different channels. And the logic was maintained by many people for many years and everyone in the company thinks they have the attribution model last click or first click doesn't matter the pretty standard way of attribute uh, the sales because it was PL SQL things uh, the marketing team couldn't maintain or understand this they couldn't easily add new channel the data team that consists from free data engineers always serve as a bottleneck for the marketing team I decided to cut this down because we stitch the attribution model among like, you know, a dozen different channels and there are some rules based on the case statement and one channel can overwrite another one. It wasn't the last click, it was completely something different. And this was the hardest thing. You go through the logic, through the code, and then you need to present to marketing team how it actually works, that they understood. And I propose them to switch from this sourcing the data from dozen different sources and trying to join it together to just align with the we use adobe clickstream i forgot the, exactly the tool just stick to the single tool maybe the quality will be a bit drop because we're not collecting all the data for this clickstream data but we will simplify everything and we will manage everything in one place everyone will understand the logic I, and i did the poc to compare the difference between sales and attribution, how big the difference between old and new approach. So it was quite good, yeah. So the biggest challenge is the logic. I assume uh, your current migration, because you can migrate the tables, you can migrate the data, but you need to go take each data pipeline, take it apart, go through the marketing and just make sure you understand. And then, yeah, for me, usually works approach from top to bottom, they can take the, the marketing dashboard, documented backwards from fact tables to the I don't know, source tables, uh, note all the transformations, and then actually present this to the marketing team and do this. Overall, I have very good experience with Redshift because I mentioned I built free Redshift three times from scratch in Amazon. During migration to Redshift, did you have any design constipation? Did you need to optimize tables? Redshift is a platform as a service. It's different from Snowflake that you have like just managed data warehouse. Especially the time that I built it, we had only instances either compute or memory optimized. The, there are not many things give you for sizing. It's either distribution style for the big tables and the sort key. And with sort key is easy. It's usually if you have, it's everything that you use in where condition, uh, no, usually the date, and we use daily data warehouse, so the date was fine for sort key for the big fact table. For huge uh, fact tables, we use distribution key. For for small, it could be all, and for like medium size, it's even. I couldn't say that our data warehouse was very big, because I was kind of starting from scratch. Usually, I just starting small, and the C performance. My biggest concern with uh, Redshift is concurrency. Even the first one is concurrency. 
especially then you hook BI tool and people starting sending ad hoc queries, some queries not optimized. You need to care about workflow manage management, trying to split the workload for the business users. I had examples with Redshift that I was more like consumer. The biggest Amazon Alexa Redshift that they use for reporting and the primary reason why they use Redshift because for Data Lake, that they built on top of Elastic Map Reduce and S3 and Spark, they store data in Parquet where there wasn't any way to do GDPR enforcement. So you couldn't just go and delete. And this then idea of Delta Lake was raised. And then I basically took this idea and implemented uh, in Microsoft Gaming, building this like data bricks and Delta Lake, the clear idea that I can overcome those challenges of Delta Lake. Redshift, it had 128 nodes. The problem is you couldn't scale it up you, and you couldn't move everything to data lake because you have obligation to delete once a week the users that requested to be deleted and the concurrency was the biggest issue. And once this Redshift instance uses a like central Redshift and then different teams pull data to their smaller Redshift, they use internal tools. And once I use API that can trigger SQL query through CLI to dump the data to my S3 bucket. I wrote little script for this API because I, I had to backfill two years of data. And I wrote the little script that will launch 720 jobs concurrently. Basically, I submitted 700 jobs concurrently to this biggest Redshift cluster. I didn't know all the details when I did this. Apparently, my script blocked this Redshift for like two days. And team couldn't figure out this because if you look on the metrics, Redshift is working all fine. The queries is running. It took them a while to figure out that actually all the queries are the same and coming from the same person. But what I like in Snowflake, you don't need to design for the fact tables. Uh, you don't need to care about concurrency. You have the warehouses. For example, my project with uh, Snowflake, we had the data warehouse and uh, we pay 100,000 a month. 100,000 US dollars a month. And uh, the problem with Snowflake, it's, it's working well. It's working fine, everything's super, but your cost is just linearly growing. Snowflake, it's very easy to burn the money. You come to the point that you start monitoring the cost meeting every week and see the most expensive queries. The most expensive queries coming from DBT models. In any project, the first you're starting just build, 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 build. Everything works fine, everyone happy. Then you finish the building, you come to the point, okay, now we need to optimize the cost. And I think with Snowflake, the biggest challenge is the cost. You should track it from the early days and decide how many warehouse you need, how, what's the size of the warehouse, how the people using them. The Snowflake has the idea of micro partitions. As soon as you load data in Snowflake, it's trying to decide it for you. And then it runs the query. It also trying to optimize the best possible way for you. This is one thing. And the second, you have dedicated warehouses for your queries. And also, it depends because the modern Redshift that I don't know what kind of cluster you have, Array 3, that is trying to stall idea of Redshift of decoupling storage and compute. But I think it's still not that good because I still work with Redshift Spectrum and it's troubling. But the idea that your storage in Snowflake is a kind of like unlimited and you have a bunch of compute clusters that can access these. If I would talk about Redshift, traditional Redshift, DC or like, uh, I don't know, DX, they usually ties together. You have single cluster of compute nodes and you have the, your storage. You might be limited either by storage or by compute. If you need to increase, you need to increase both storage and compute. Snowflake for me is the perfect tool that I can just focus on the work and build, knowing that I don't need to tune each of my queries, at least in the initial phase. Why do you think Snowflake will perform better compared to Redshift, not regarding the cost? If I wouldn't care about the cost, I the only thing I might do, for example, when I use dbt models in Snowflake, I can specify the cluster key for the table that I'm going to use in the very condition. For the huge tables, it might help. I know the right techniques in Snowflake that you you change the pattern 
how you store your huge tables and do similar what you can do in uh, by default in Redshift, define those distributions in sort keys. But I never did this with Snowflake. So the only optimization I use is the cluster key. And then I'm more like looking into behavior of particular warehouse just to, to understand is it utilized well. And sometimes it's underutilized, then I can decrease the size of the warehouse or it's overutilized and then I need to increase the size of the warehouse. That's the only I concern in Snowflake. What metrics would you look to understand utilization condition of a cluster? The one particular metric I can look to the spill and uh, depends on the spill. When we look to the query plan and the query plan is succeed, it can tell us uh, what's the spill, uh, how much uh, rec bytes and rows process and writes and shuffle in across the networking. That's the input information for myself to decide. There was very good article about this, how you can leverage those metrics. I don't have it in my head, I know this article, and this is probably I'm going to use if I need to understand this topic. The benefits of Snowflake, they give you the tools out of the box to do the same. What In Databricks, I need to go to Spark UI like metrics and see how my nodes is utilized and how it works. So the first one, we have the game sale, CSV 1 million records, um, customer ID, customer name, sale data, date. And the second one, zip code CSV, and so write a PCTL code Python prefer from cut based on. So for example, for this one, I will use the data frames and uh, with the data frames, uh, is it fine if I will use PySpark? Oh. So I can, yeah, I, I probably can do the same in, in Pandas, but I just not using Pandas too often for like production material. So I can, cr cr yeah. Yeah, I can create a bunch of um, uh, data frames. So here I need to perform the join between two data frames. And uh, what I'm doing, so I need all columns from, from this one and adding city and province from this one.
so I can then I can specify the condition. And we can also decide is it inner or left. And we assume that we have all the data together, so we'll stick to the inner join. I think that that's it. Okay. Oh, I see. Yeah, sorry, I missed this. So in the in this case, the file will contain duplicates. So here, I can I can tell already uh, distinct. So, and it means this data frame will already have the, the unique records. And, uh, yeah, the, the one thing here, because we don't want to show zip code twice, so it maybe can also uh, list all, all the columns that I want, want to bring. And so on. Anything else? Compute two, top two games all and each city. So, uh, to get the top two games sold in each city, first we need to get a ranking of games sold per city, and then uh, we can we can apply the, the filter. Okay, before I do this, I want to calculate how many... Okay, what I can do, we have uh, city and I will, yeah, since it's... Uh, what is important here is the data quality topic because if we have like states and the city might be the same, so it's 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 better to to have some kind of like be, use better like you know not just the city because we have Vancouver uh, in 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 Washington yeah and I recently got got the issue I was in Seattle went to the train to Vancouver BC at like 6 a.m. and I sit in the train I bought the tickets and then the train started this train went to Vancouver in like to towards the Portland instead of Vancouver, BC. Yeah, but he yeah, here the idea, assuming it's the city is Unix and we like, just simplify, so I can count the sale data. So assuming here that we don't have any order ID, so we can I even just have the count star as uh, 
quarters. Yeah, definitely. Like in real world, I need I need to check. So city, uh, the game name. So ideally, I would I would need to count like some number of orders. Yeah, because the customer if customer buy it, like couple couple games. Oh no! Oh, we have the quantity here. Yeah, then I just need to game name. Zoom uh, quantity. Okay, we have these, and we can also rank. A better dense rank. Ah, uh, partition. And then I need to add group by. And what I like in Snowflake, I can do group by all. And then I don't need to know how many numbers I need to put here. Uh, so this CTE will give me CT game name, uh, their sales, and uh, ranking inside this window. So, and then here. I can have Yeah, something like this. Uh, because it could be the situation that um, we might have uh, the same number for game sa sales. So, for example, like FIFA and the Formula One, they can have the same quantity. So, the dense rank will like solve this problem. Oh, yeah, so I will need to, yeah, I missed this. Yeah, here, uh, no, actually here, I'm just by row number. That was my, my plan. But I think, um, yeah, the one thing I, I can tell it for sure, will it work all in one query? Because if this is, then I execute and it, for example, will not run, work right, so I will just adding one more one more CTE where I can because I, I don't have the option to test it right now so assuming just to make sure that it work I can put it this uh, into individual. Oh no, not here. Yeah. 
something like this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, actually, oh, actually, I don't need here partitions anymore. Uh, because it's already the, the window that I have. So I, I need, um, I might, uh, no, I think I, I might need only order by Oh, it's, I, I see. Then, uh, then here I need partition by city, right? On my project with Trina, we also had the BigQuery as the initial and I migrated the pipelines with the logs data from BigQuery and I just what I did again first I, we, we had the Kafka stream that was written to GCP and pushed to BigQuery the plan was to switch the pipeline to write to GCP storage uh, in Parquet format and then we had around three years of data that lots of terabytes of data. What I did, I, I unloaded data from BigQuery to Parquet and then iteratively reprocessed this data and placed to the Trino. My key question is to understand the plan for this kind of migration. Does it mean that currently Redshift uh, is a um, kind of primary data warehouse and the goal to move to Snowflake? How you load the marketing data, like marketing sources? What what do you use? Uh, what tool do you use? Fivetran or like custom written? Do you use uh, DBT on top of Redshift? And do you have any kind of data catalog? Like do you rely on DBT docs or external one? Oh, I'm good. Yeah, I don't have any other questions.